There may never have been a cabal quite so entirely vile as the inner circle of Adolf Hitler. From his chief propagandist Joseph Goebbels to his Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering to men like Heinrich Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich who worked to orchestrate the Holocaust, Hitler's most trusted lieutenants could be counted on to be among the most wicked and dreadful figures of their day. But even at the height of their power, even as they waged war against humanity itself, Hitler and his closest allies had a spy in their midst. Working as an admiral of the Kriegsmarine Navy and the chief of Germany's military intelligence service, the Abwehr, the spy was in perfect position to undermine the Nazi party even as he contributed directly to its conquest of Europe. His name was Wilhelm Canaris, and he was a hell of an enigma. Canaris was no freedom fighter, no lover of peace, a known anti-Semite and an early supporter of Adolf Hitler. But by the end of the Second World War, he had become a key member of the resistance against Hitler's rule and had done more to bring down the Third Reich than nearly any individual person in the entire war. From his days as a dedicated Nazi and architect of the Holocaust, to his disillusionment with Hitler, to the series of events that saw him killed just weeks before he might have been rescued by the Allies, this is the life of Wilhelm Canaris, one of the most fascinating anti-heroes to ever live. Now, he was born into a wealthy family in the town of Aplerbeck in German Prussia's Westphalia province. Young Wilhelm grew up dreaming of service in the Imperial German Navy, which at that time was quickly growing from a small coastal defense force to one of the preeminent navies of the world. At the age of 18, young Wilhelm joined up as an aspiring officer, and although we won't belabor all of the fine points of his naval service, suffice to say that he earned a commission as a lieutenant in 1910. Working in naval intelligence, Canaris was perfectly placed to take part in the First World War when it broke out in 1914, and during that same year, the young officer made his mark as a key advisor on the light cruiser SMS Dresden. The lone surviving German ship after a battle with the British near the Falklands Islands, the Dresden had spent months evading and outwitting British ships before finally being pinned down in March of 19. As the key intelligence officer aboard the Dresden, Canaris had been the man responsible for completely frustrating British forces in the South Atlantic, blatantly laying false trails and deceptions while refueling and resupplying at will. When the Dresden was finally caught, Canaris rose to the occasion again, negotiating with the British ship that had tracked him down in order to buy time while his crew evacuated the Dresden, sunk the ship, and caused an international incident with the neutral nation of Chile. Fluent in both Spanish and English, Canaris had no trouble escaping British custody before crossing the Andes on foot and horseback and heading back to Germany. After such a massive coup, Canaris became known up and down the German Navy, earning him a reputation that would open countless doors for him in the coming years. Over the remainder of World War I, Canaris would join a burgeoning effort to create an organized intelligence arm of the German military, which previously lacked a centralized authority to collect or act on sensitive information. Canaris took lead on building an intelligence network in Spain in order to track Allied shipping in the Mediterranean, cultivating a number of Spanish assets in the process. He also oversaw the construction of a fleet of disguised supply ships, which could fly under Spanish flags with Spanish crews while resupplying German U-boats. During these years, Canaris engaged in enough Bond-level spy sh to really be its own video, and by the end of the war, he had finished his mission in Spain, become captain of a U-boat, and met the woman who would become his wife, Erika Arg. Now, it's important to take just a moment here and outline just what sort of man Canaris was at this time. Part of a long tradition of naval officers, ones who saw maritime warfare as the highest form of military strategy and tactics, Canaris was a deep believer in military fealty to the state. Just as important, he was an ardent German nationalist with a deep, at times hyper-patriotic belief in German culture and society as the pinnacle of human civilization. Discipline, order, chivalry, and most of all respect for the German ideal were at the cornerstone of Wilhelm Canaris' approach to his world. So. When Canaris and his U-boat returned to Germany in November 1918 and found the entire German Grand Fleet in mutiny against Kaiser Wilhelm II, it's hard to imagine that his reaction would have been anything less than complete horror. With the German state in full collapse, the nation Canaris loved would quickly descend into anarchy. His response was to become an indispensable agent for the surviving military and the political right, both of which leaned hard on his abilities in subterfuge. He also ensured that he would remain part of the German navy, even after its size was starkly limited by the Treaty of Versailles. Now, it's about this time that Canaris met a young man named Reinhard Heydrich, who would go on to stand beside Canaris in Hitler's innermost circle. Canaris was a relatively inconsequential officer on the training ship when young Heydrich was stationed as a cadet. And despite Heydrich's really incredible levels of unpopularity on the ship, Canaris took Heydrich under his wing. 
By this point, Heydrich was already a virulent anti-Semite, but Canaris was himself deeply embroiled in the conspiracy theories of the time, desperate to pin the German defeat on the Jews, the communists, or, well, really just about anybody except for the German military itself. Now, Heydrich flunked out of the Navy not long after, but his relationship with Canaris would persist for decades. After years of laying low, Canaris got back into the intelligence game in 1924, when he traveled to Japan to assist with the secret construction of U-boats. Then he returned to Spain to do the same thing there. The deep connections that he made with the Spanish state allowed him to build intelligence ties there, and Canaris set up a program for German pilots to gain combat experience in the Spanish Air Force. All Canaris's work during this time was in an attempt to build back German combat capabilities under the radar, going well beyond what was permitted by the Treaty of Versailles. This dream was shared by many on the German political right, but by the early 1930s, it also brought Canaris into the orbit of Adolf Hitler in a far more meaningful way. Now, by this time in German history, Adolf Hitler had gone from a young revolutionary upstart into a terrifyingly capable populist, and he'd gotten himself the office of German Chancellor. For Canaris, the idea of a somewhat thug-like, unapologetic fascist was not a close match to his idea of a proper German leader, but Hitler's anti-communist rhetoric was more than enough for Canaris to consider an alliance of convenience. Hitler would quickly seal the deal, expressing his interest in rehabilitating the German navy on the scale of a major power. It's unknown whether the anti-Semitic aspect of Nazism might have appealed to Canaris or given him pause, but it clearly wasn't enough of an obstacle to make Canaris turn away. Instead, he picked up on Hitler's desire for a more robust secret service in order to counter British intelligence, and seeing that the German military intelligence organization, the Abwehr, had just appointed a naval officer as chief for the first time, Canaris saw an opportunity. Among other things, Canaris was coming in with a proven track record of intelligence success, not just in general, but dedicated to the exact kind of remilitarization that Hitler was interested in. He understood politics and economics. He had the support of Reinhard Heydrich, who by then had become one of Hitler's deputies. He was fluent in English and Spanish with connections to England and to Spain, and he was already a minor war hero who had garnered a great deal of respect in the military. He was known for keeping his head down, doing his job, and being far more concerned with gathering intelligence than playing politics. In short, he was perfect. And when the prior Abwehr chief started feuding with the Nazis a little too enthusiastically, it was Canaris who filled the role. Canaris and Reinhard Heydrich had, by this point, learned to be wary of each other, and Canaris was well aware that he would be under surveillance from Heydrich's own intelligence agency. He'd been appointed in secret with his identity unknown to the British, the French, and most of Germany as well. And he took full advantage of that anonymity. In fact, most foreign diplomats who met Canaris in these years thought him to be a relatively low-level figure, despite the title of admiral that he had long since earned. But he also deepened the ties between the Abwehr and the Nazi state, even calling for comradely cooperation with the Gestapo during his first speech. Behind the scenes, Canaris explained to his officers that the Abwehr would need to play nice with the Nazis in order to have any degree of autonomy while not stooping to the levels of violence that the Gestapo employed. The Abwehr Canaris created was very much in the style of his own personal brand of spycraft, clearly focused on the value of human intelligence with the desire to cultivate relationships first and use coercion and sabotage only as a last resort. He became well-liked by the officers of the Abwehr, despite his age and disheveled appearance, and in dozens of private meetings with Hitler, it would appear that he made a good impression. Canaris was an expert at making his targets feel listened to, even charmed, and oh, with a target as easily flattered as the Führer, he had an easy time ingratiating himself. He is also believed to have been the person who suggested to Hitler that the Nazis begin branding Jews in public by forcing them to wear the Star of David. Granted, the Nazis had not yet begun to set up death camps for the global Jewish population, and it's unclear whether Canaris' motivations for the suggestion reflected an inner anti-Semitism or more of a political motivation. But even still, it's probable that Canaris was responsible for a key step that would lead to millions of Jews being killed. Canaris set about making the Abwehr indispensable to the regime. He was also able to protect the Abwehr's claim to German espionage, which other organizations were not supposed to be handling. He divided the organization into five sections, one for espionage abroad, one for sabotage and paramilitary special forces, one for counter-espionage, one for foreign collaboration, and one to oversee the whole apparatus. The whole thing was shrouded in secrecy, and given its sharp contrast to the Gestapo, it should perhaps be unsurprising that it quickly became a gathering point for Germans who were actively involved in resistance against the Nazis. 
In the years leading to World War II, Canaris would be instrumental in talking Hitler into aiding Francisco Franco of Spain in his rise to power. He also began tracing British and Soviet intelligence networks, routing them out at times, or keeping tabs on them for the future. But these were also the years when Canaris first started to become disillusioned with Hitler. In 1937, the Soviet Union executed 35,000 of its own military officers, a purge that Reinhard Heydrich claimed that it orchestrated. Hitler would later claim publicly that he too would kill thousands of officers if it meant protecting the Nazi state. Heydrich's actions and Hitler's endorsement of them violated many of Canaris' deepest beliefs about military honor. And if Canaris had already been worried about his nation's slide into profound immorality, then this was a powerful confirmation of what he had feared. After the incident, his deputies found him to be withdrawn, almost in shock. And we know in hindsight that this is when Canaris began working actively to undermine Heydrich. He began by issuing a series of secret commands to the Abwehr, instructing his agents to form a sub-state organization to unify anti-Nazi forces and prepare them for potentially illegal actions. He directed the Abwehr to remove fanatical Nazis, or those suspected to be on Heydrich's payroll, and directed agents to protect people the Gestapo had their sights on. He clearly instructed his agents that if they were ordered to kidnap or assassinate a Gestapo target, they were to orchestrate a believable failure to prevent it. He also started working to frustrate Germany's nascent nuclear program, something he would continue to do through the entire war. He began keeping a personal diary to track the excesses of the Nazis and reached out to trusted contacts in London and Madrid. As a longtime colleague, Juan March wrote to a friend, Canaris is not what he seems. He has learned a lesson and will now merely hold on to his powers in the intelligence world to find out Hitler's plans and to thwart him until some new rulers can be brought to power. For Canaris, the last straw came after a small conference on November 5, 1937, in which Hitler announced to senior German leaders that he was planning a war of expansion. Canaris did not attend the meeting, but when he learned of what Hitler had said, his choice was made. Canaris never believed in the prospect of a Nazi victory in Europe, and he was utterly convinced that defeat could mean the end of the Germany he once loved. Although he would publicly support the war effort, and he could not stop a military conflict, he would work tirelessly to undermine Hitler at every turn, and he would need the help of the Allies to do it. At first, Canaris wasn't sure whether the British would oppose Nazi expansion at all, but he sent an envoy to let London know that a secret anti-Nazi faction existed at the highest levels of government. It's likely that Canaris' identity was revealed around this time. And as he made it clear that he was legit, the British began to listen a bit more closely for what Canaris needed. During this time, he also established close links with the Vatican, whose intelligence arm was among the best in the world at the time, and he began to collect information on the American military aviation program and the UK's development of radar. Despite his desire to ally with the British, Canaris had no qualms about spying on them, and he had already broken a number of British ciphers even prior to the war. What's more, he and the Abwehr created a suite of sabotage operations that he could present to Hitler and cultivated assets for German intelligence within the British military. But frontline visits to Poland and a front row seat to the massacres the Nazis perpetrated there only reassured Canaris about the importance of his broader goals. He worked actively to undermine the Gestapo while keeping careful notes on just how many Poles they were executing. In fact, he began to take a leading role in the conspiracy to overthrow Hitler, soliciting support from as many generals as he could. He began to organize smuggling and rescue operations in Poland, often turning the people his agents rescued into long-term intelligence assets. This would pay especially huge dividends. Many of those same Poles would be used by the Nazis for forced labor all up and down German-held territory, and they were in a unique position to report back everything the Nazis were doing, even far from Allied lines. As the war raged on and the Nazis encroached on the English Channel, Canaris walked an incredibly fine balance, contributing enough to the Nazis that the Abwehr became instrumental in defeating the British, but holding back just enough that the Nazis could not achieve total victory. Between his deep ties in Germany and his extensive network in Britain, Canaris may have been the most acutely aware person in the entire world of the precise balance of power between both sides. His officers were expected to place themselves in a similar position, carrying out Hitler's orders while pursuing Allied contacts anywhere that they could and trying to open lines of communication. Canaris was instrumental in helping the Nazis take Norway and was promoted from rear admiral to full admiral for his trouble. At the same time, he saw to it that the wife of an Abwehr officer was committed to a mental institution just before she would have revealed to the Gestapo that the Abwehr were plotting against Hitler. 
Canaris and the Abwehr effectively spearheaded the invasion of France, laying the groundwork for easy Nazi victories, while also leaking details of Nazi plans to the British Homars directly to Winston Churchill. He drew up plans for Berlin to attack London while constantly inflating the numbers of troops London had to defend itself. He frequently aided Jews and other targets of the Holocaust in finding escape while at the same time propping up the Nazis, knowing fully well that they were perpetrating a genocide. And when Hitler traveled to Spain to convince dictator Francisco Franco to join the war, Canaris saw to it that Franco had been prepared enough with anti-war talking points to leave Hitler stuttering. Some historians argue that Franco's refusal was the very moment that World War II became unwinnable for the Nazis. By this time, though, Canaris had a watcher of his own, Sir Stuart Menzies, head of British MI6, that is to say London's version of Canaris himself. Menzies had worked out that Canaris was responsible for a number of oddities within the Nazi offensive, and although it's unclear just how quickly Menzies started to aid Canaris, certain British intelligence efforts, for example a delivery of $10 million made to Francisco Franco just as Canaris's agents were helping Franco resist Hitler, well, let's just say that there were a lot of these happy coincidences. Around London, Menzies started shutting down speculation that Canaris might be a British ally. After all, loose lips on the British side could have doomed any such collaboration before it really got underway. Instead, the two sides established a small network of double agents and couriers that would allow them, if not to communicate directly, then at least to pass messages when it was most desperately needed. Inside the Nazi regime, conflict between Canaris and Heydrich was reaching a fever pitch. Although Canaris could have revealed Heydrich's Jewish ancestry at any time and got in his career destroyed, Heydrich had far more power within the regime. They shared an outwardly cordial relationship. In fact, their villas outside Berlin shared a common garden. But Canaris found Heydrich's methods abhorrent, and Heydrich saw Canaris as a clear threat. When Heydrich gained control of Prague and the surrounding Czech regions, he began to pivot for control of the Abwehr, forcing Canaris to concede most of his power. But during a trip to Spain, Canaris is believed to have gotten word to British intelligence about just how bad things were getting. Heydrich was within inches of convincing the Reich to reorganize its intelligence structure, and MI6 Chief Menzies responded in force. Though a plot to assassinate Heydrich had been in the works for months and was strongly opposed within Britain because it almost guaranteed brutal reprisals on the local Czech population, Menzies appears to have ensured that it took place just days before Heydrich would oust Canaris for good. On the 27th of May 1942, Heydrich was assassinated in Operation Anthropoid. The tears Canaris shed at Heydrich's funeral would suggest that he perhaps hadn't known the assassination was coming, or at least that quickly. And though it had removed Canaris's most powerful opponent, it also killed a man he had known since Heydrich was barely a man at all. So, with Heydrich dead, Canaris and Menzies could continue working toward the defeat of the Nazis without obstruction. Their goal, as they saw it, was an understanding between Berlin and the Allies, one that would lead either to a peace from which Hitler could then be overthrown, or the overthrow of Hitler, thus leading to a peace. Canaris began traveling to Spain more and more frequently, even making it clear that he was open to a direct meeting with Menzies and he had made a habit of creating subtle shows of good faith. Leaked intelligence here, a rescued British asset there. Now, it's unclear whether Canaris and Menzies ever met in person, but if they did, then it was in late 1942 when both men converged on the area around Gibraltar. Canaris appeared to believe that his communications with Menzies were bearing fruit, even with major setbacks like President Franklin Roosevelt's announcement in early 1943 that only unconditional surrender by Germany could end the war. Canaris saw this as a doomed approach, one that would fail the same or even worse than the Treaty of Versailles. But if anything, this prompted him to keep even closer touch with Menzies, and Menzies clearly appreciated it. During this time, a Soviet double agent within British intelligence named Kim Philby proposed an operation to kill Canaris, an idea Menzies shut down immediately. Canaris also became aware of an attempt on Hitler's life, which failed in March 1943, but which Canaris didn't attempt to oppose. It's around this time that Canaris began to face more and more suspicion from the elite in Berlin. Hardcore Nazis had always distrusted him, but over the few months prior, they'd begun obscuring key information and hiding operations from Canaris. In April 1943, the Gestapo began a crackdown on Canaris' allies and began interrogating him directly about his known contacts and who had links in common with Moscow. Under such pressure, Canaris began to become more visibly nervous in his work, and now that he knew a conditional peace with the Allies was off the table, he became single-minded in his dedication to ensure that the Nazis went down with a German ship. Canaris started taking greater and greater risks, and as the Gestapo's suspicions about the Abwehr began to be confirmed, the organization came closer and closer to collapse. 
In February 1944, Canaris was summoned to what would be his final meeting with Adolf Hitler. Furious about a prominent Abwehr officer who had defected, Hitler accused Canaris of allowing the Abwehr to collapse. And when Canaris refused to play to Hitler's ego, his organization was cleared to be taken over by the Gestapo. Canaris was ushered out of work, and the Abwehr essentially collapsed, with most of its officers in the know deciding to get out as fast as they could. Officers unlucky enough to be in enemy territory or quickly found out due to the incompetence of the Gestapo leadership. Canaris himself was held for months at a castle in Lower Saxony, where he quickly and visibly deteriorated as the years of stress finally set in. He was able to get word out to Menzies one last time, revealing German plans ahead of the D-Day landings, and had a quick exchange of letters with him. Although the content of Menzies' letters is unknown, it had a visible effect on Canaris. After reading it, he proclaimed Germany to be finished. On the 20th of July 1944, Adolf Hitler was nearly assassinated in yet another conspiracy, this one using a time bomb at Hitler's headquarters. Canaris knew the attack was coming. He had already evacuated his family to Bavaria, and on the day of the assassination attempt, he received a direct phone call from the assassin who claimed that Hitler was dead. When news arrived hours later that Hitler had in fact survived, Canaris knew damn well it would mean his head. Three days later, he was arrested, and though the arresting officer was an ally who offered him a chance to escape, Canaris refused. Unlike most of the conspirators in the assassination attempt, Canaris was kept alive, probably because Hitler's right-hand man, Heinrich Himmler, was also trying to arrange a peace without Hitler's approval and wanted to leverage Canaris's British contacts. Until the end, Canaris was as crafty as ever, and during his imprisonment, he was known for running intellectual circles around his guards and interrogators. Through 1944 into 1945, Canaris was kept alive, and he was not tortured. Eventually, his diaries were found containing a full account of his British contacts and his intents, and this was enough for Hitler to finally overcome opposition in order that Canaris be killed. In a sham trial, Canaris was sentenced to death by hanging, after which it appears that he was beaten at least once. His last words, tapped out in code to a former Danish intelligence chief in the next cell over, read as follows. I die for my fatherland. I have a clean conscience. I only did my duty for my country when I tried to oppose the criminal folly of Hitler leading Germany to destruction. Look after my wife and daughters. At dawn the next day, he was hanged twice. The first as a final act of torment that brought him to the edge of death, and the second to finish the job. Not long after he died, so too would Adolf Hitler, and then Nazi Germany itself, a grotesque attempt at empire that perhaps nobody on earth had done more than Wilhelm Canaris to bring down. Canaris and his legacy are nearly impossible to quantify in full. After all, how does one make sense of a man who ensured that millions would die at the hands of the Nazis, all in the name of bringing down Hitler? Finally, we won't endeavor to tell our viewers how they should imagine Canaris. Instead, we'll leave you with the words of Richard Bassett, whose 2012 biography of Wilhelm Canaris was instrumental in bringing this video to you. In Bassett's own words, the temptation to beautify the admiral must be resisted. He was, in his own way, a ruthless exponent of all the techniques of deception, disinformation, and other patterns of subterfuge, without which no successful secret intelligence agency can exist. He was also, for far too long, a believer. It took Canaris slightly longer than many others to see the Nazis for what they really were. But once he became convinced that they were leading his country to ruin both physical and moral, he never wavered from a policy of systematically undermining the regime from within and seeking an understanding with the West." End quote. In doing so, Wilhelm Canaris did more to decide the outcome of World War II than almost any other person who lived through it. Without him, the world would be very different today.